This morning, we're continuing in our exile series, and we've been asking and wrestling with this question, how are followers of Jesus to live in the ever-turbulent 21st century, navigating these um, complex cultural times? And what we said is the book of 1 Peter, or the letter of 1 Peter, is God's answer to that question for us. And the major theme of 1 Peter is this that we are to live as exiles, as sojourners, as temporary residents, as those who have an eternal perspective that are citizens of heaven here on earth, who possess this living hope that Jesus is coming back, that he is returning, and, and he will restore and remake this world. And as a result, we then live, or it produces, a holy life. And so we've been journeying the last uh, few weeks through the book of 1 Peter. Chapter 1 unpacks this theme theologically. Uh, chapter 2, 3, 4, and 5 then begin to unpack it practically. What does it look like to live as exiles who possess a living hope and that produces holy living? And so last week we talked about this a new kind of community. What does it look like as a new community of exiles together? And what is, it, what is distinctive about us? He's now going to shift his attention outside, not just this community, but living in a culture that doesn't um, embrace your values or vision for life. And, let me, and so he's going to shift to this. And the question before us this morning is, what do you do? When you're stuck in an unjust system, you cannot change. What do you do when you're stuck? Like, you, there's nothing you can do to get out of it. You feel like you're at the end of one of those mazes, if you will, and you're just stuck. You hit a dead end. In an unjust, unfair, unrighteous system, and you can't do anything about it. Maybe another way to ask, what do you do when life's not fair, when the odds are stacked against you. And Peter's going to say to us this morning, the response of the exiled people and how we engage in a culture that does not value or celebrate what we value as exiles of Jesus is this thing, this idea called beautiful living. Would you just say to your neighbor real quick, beautiful living, Go ahead, turn to the other neighbor and say, beautiful living. Good, we got that out of the way. You see, what Peter is going to tell us and we're going to unpack for the next few moments is, is we're called to then live beautifully, these beautiful, winsome lives in the face of an evil world. In fact, uh, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 is going to give us the overview of what this looks like, and then he's going to give us three specific examples of how do we live out these beautiful lives in the face of a corrupt, unjust, evil system. If you've got your Bibles, would you open up to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter 2, or your, if you've got your phones, open the app, please. You ready? Here we go. Let's dive in. Dear friends... Underline that word, dear friends. Dear friends, I urge you, I implore you, I plead with you as foreigners and exiles, as strangers. In our groups, we've been studying uh, the life of Daniel together. And Daniel was a young man that was ripped from his home and placed into captivity in Babylon, being indoctrinated into the ways of Babylon. And yet he held fast to his Jewish identity and ways. He says, in like manner, that's the way we're to view our lives as followers of Jesus, to abstain then from sinful desires, to say no to certain compromises or things that are going on. Abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. And then he says on the positive, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, Though, though they may not believe what you believe, though they may not understand why you're doing what you're doing, though they may misunderstand you, you know the early church was really misunderstood in the early days. In fact, the early church was misunderstood in a number of fundamental ways. Uh, in fact, uh, they were called atheist and anarchist because they would not declare Caesar as Lord. In a pluralistic, polytheistic culture, 
uh, embracing a new God or adding Caesar is great, but to say one God, let alone not declaring Caesar, they said, you're an atheist. And then they were anarchists because they wouldn't declare Caesar as Lord, they would only declare Jesus as Lord. They were misunderstood or they were slandered or um, accused of doing wrong and in the area of, they were called cannibals because they would have these gatherings together where they celebrated the Lord's Supper, where you talk about this is his body broken for you, his blood poured out, and his bread and his wine, and they, and they began to spread all these rumors. They were, they were accused of incestual relationships because they, in the community of followers of, believer, uh, followers of Jesus, they talked about one another as brothers and sisters, and yet greeted one another with a holy kiss. And they're like, wow, you guys are incestual. There's all these accusations that were nowhere close. And here's what he says. In those unfair accusations, live good lives. Why? That they may see your good deeds. This word for good, there's two Greek words for good. Uh, The first Greek word is agathos, which just means good, morally good, right, or pure. And then the other word, kalos, which means it has that moral goodness sense to it, but it also means to be beautiful, attractive, pleasing, winsome. This is that word here. He's saying beautiful living, that they may see your beautiful life and glorify God on the day he visits you. See, what do you do when you're stuck in an unjust system you cannot change? Peter's gonna say, live a beautiful life before him. Don't combat them with trying to tell them all the ways that you're right and the way they're wrong. Just live it out. And he gives us three key things for us when we're living beautiful lives. What does that look like? First, hold fast to your identity in Christ. I had you underline the word dear friends. In the Greek, it's actually beloved. There's two core ideas he's, he's saying to these believers. Your identity as beloved in Christ and your identity that you're not a part of this world. You're exiles. You are a citizen of heaven. Hold fast to your identity in Christ. In fact, next to that, would you jot down Ephesians 1? Ephesians 1 is an incredible treatise on your identity in Christ, that you are adopted into the family of God, you have been forgiven completely, redeemed, bought back, that you are chosen by God, and it just unpacks who you are in Christ, that you would hold fast, that my standing, my position is beloved by God. And so I can love the world around me. I don't have to seek the world for love. Hold fast to your identity, and as a result, refuse to cave to sin. This distinction, holy living, there's a way of living that is not to be among the people of God. In fact, if you flip over to Galatians chapter 5, when it's talking about abstaining or keeping away from these sinful desires or these passions of the flesh, uh, flip over to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul writes this and unpacking this a little bit further. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. We see it, whether we agree with it as obvious or not, but we know this. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality. Anything outside the sexual ethic that is for God's design for humanity says, have nothing to do with it, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. And you're like, well, I haven't done much witchcraft lately, Ingram. Thank you very much. Hatred, next word. Anybody you hate lately? Well, I know you feel justified by it. I get it. But, but do you hate them? Discord, jealousy. Any jealousy or envy going on in your heart? Factions, drunkenness, orgies. We won't even get into I'm not going to ask. And the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, beautiful living, first and foremost, says, I'm going to hold fast to my identity in Christ. Secondly, I'm going to refuse to cave to sin. Now, here's what we do in our culture today. We no longer call sin a sin. Okay? You know what we say? I'm struggling. It's a mistake. 
See, until we actually agree that sin is the greatest pain that this world is suffering and that it's a cancer that needs to be rooted out, we'll just be satiated by it and explain it away. So we gotta refuse to cave to sin. It's not just, oh, I'm struggling over here. It's just a mistake. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Adultery is not a mistake. It's called sin. And it's destroying you and relationships around you. And so he says, when you have a new identity, you'll say no to those things and instead walk in integrity. What does walking in integrity look like? It means doing what is right no matter the outcome. Doing what is right no matter what the outcome would be, okay? It, I'm gonna tell the truth even though it means it might hurt my chances of getting this job. I'm going to do what is right even though it might hurt my chances of getting to go out with that girl or that guy. I'm going to walk in integrity. Another way of thinking about integrity and understanding this is in Philippians 2, 14. I love this passage. The Apostle Paul explains this out if you're trying to flip over there with me, I like GE Power Company. Uh, maybe I don't like GE Power Company, but it's an acronym, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, that you can figure out those uh, books in the middle. But Philippians 2.14 says this. I'm almost there. 14. 12, 14, there we go. Do everything. Uh, what is everything? Help me out, help me out. Everything. Now notice this. In every circumstance, whether fair or unfair, every circumstance, whether just or unjust, in every relationship, do everything. Notice this. Without grumbling or arguing. Why? so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then I love this next line. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word in you. Walking in integrity has more to do with what we don't say than what we do and the attitude that we bring. See, I think... Christians have lost their witness because we are not living beautiful lives. We're complaining about the deterioration of the culture around us. What would it look like if we said, no, no, beloved of God, my identity, I'm going to refuse to cave to this. I'm embracing this as how I am as a follower of Jesus. And as a result, I'm walking with integrity. I'm going to do what's right regardless of the cost. That is a generation, and that is a people of influence and impact. Beautiful living in an evil, perverse world shines like stars when we walk in integrity. And so then the Apostle Paul then gives us three examples of what does this look like and what it looks like for the context of the people in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, of how to live this out in the midst of injustice. He gives us the first example of an unjust authority. And to give you the historical context, the book of Peter, you remember if you've been traveling along, was written in about 63 to 65 AD. The emperor at the time is Nero. Emperor Nero lived from 37 AD to 68 AD. He became emperor at the age of 16 years old. That's a young age to be an emperor. And his mother actually saw an avenue to power and so was really trying to lead through him. And the early years of Nero's life, because he had counselors around him that were shaping and guiding, he actually did a great job of leadership. Uh, and yet he wanted to lead on his own. And so uh, he murdered his mom. Yeah, that is bad. Nero's rule was associated with tyranny and extravagance. He was known for these extravagant building projects, and he was actually beloved among the poor because he taxed the rich, which was, complete, was very controversial. As he got along later in his life, um, in his building project, there was the Great Fire of Rome, which many of the historians in his day blamed um, 
Nero himself for this because of clearing the way for his own palatial building complex there. But in that, he sees Christians as a scapegoat, and he began to ruthlessly persecute Christians. Uh, He would throw them to the beast in the games, in the arena, in the gladiatorial games. Uh, Then he would use Christians, he would tie them to a stake and tar them and use them as night lights in his garden, evening garden parties. And this widespread persecution swept over the church at this time. In 68 AD, he committed suicide, and that's how he ended his life. And the Apostle Peter's writing to this church under this unjust authority. Now listen to what he says. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Whose sake? The Lord's sake. To every human authority. Now notice what the next line is. Whether the emperor, as the supreme authority, literally he This is a dictatorship, authoritarian. He has the final, ultimate say. Or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now notice this. For it is God's will, circle that word, God's will, that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. But do not use your freedom to cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Literally, the word is honor. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. What do you do when you're stuck in an unjust system you cannot change? He says, live a beautiful life in the face of an evil world. In unjust authority, he's going to say this. Honor God, or out of honor for God, honor authorities. Out of honor for God, I'm going to honor authorities. Out of my honor for you, I am going to honor the authorities. Now, let's talk about the difference between honor and respect, because we're going to be hitting on honor our entire service here. Honor is given, respect is earned. And so honor is a choice, respect is a response. And so honor is something I can give to you, I can honor you whether I agree with you or not. I can honor you whether you're a good person or not. For some, this is gonna be so powerful when you think about some relationships in your life that you have struggled in because you feel like, well, they've, they're people that are hard to honor because they're not easy, they're, you can't respect them. And he says, no, no. Honor is not agreement. Honor is not making them happy. Honor is not ignoring the past or tolerating abuse. Honor is an attitude upon which I act in such a way that I will speak highly or not at all. I I will honor you even when I disagree with you. Well, does this mean I have to obey everything? Well, when it comes to the laws of the land, scripturally, what does it say? As long as... As long as it it is in alignment with God's word, we are to come under the laws of the land. When it no longer aligns with God's word, it doesn't mean we rebel and revolt. It means we respectfully disobey. And he says this, out of honor for God, honor authorities. Maybe it's the government. Maybe it's an educational authority in your life. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's local or national authorities. Maybe it's your landlord. It says, in an unjust system, beautiful living is the antidote. And so what are we to do? Doing right, what is right silences the critics. Doing what is right Did you notice that? For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. And for some, you're like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't silence them. Sometimes it just fuels them, doesn't it? See, doing what's right silenced the critics eventually. It's the consistency of a well-lived life that... They can say whatever, but they have no foundation for. 
Mother Teresa is a great example of this. For many of you, you're like, I don't even know who Mother Teresa is. She's this incredible woman who gave her life as a nun to the least of these her in Calcutta, serving lepers, and her entire life of giving. And in 1994, she was invited to the National Prayer Breakfast. And some of you are like, I wasn't even alive then. In 1994, she was invited to this breakfast, and for 34 minutes, she shares in a very open, direct, biblical vision of human life that was not politically correct. And at the end of it, received a standing ovation from Republican and Democrat alike. Because you may not agree with what she said, but you cannot deny how she lived. And there is no criticism to be found. That is the call for us as believers. I want you to notice something. Have you ever wondered what God's will for your life is? I've had that conversation countless times with a young person. Oh, I just want to know what God's will is for me. Just trying to find it. As if it's this like really weird, like ethereal thing. Somehow you'll stumble over it. I had you circle it. For it is God's will. It is God's will that by doing good, this beautiful living, holding fast to your identity, refusing to cave to sin, walking into integrity, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. You want to know what God's will for your, today, for your life today is? Do good. Do the good that God has for you. Walk in integrity. Command, out of honor for God, honor authorities, reason, doing what is right, silences the crick. Uh, critics, the application, honor everyone. Honor everyone. That our words would be honorable of everyone around us. What we post online would be honorable. Now we'd ask this question before we say it, before we receive it. Is this honoring of that person? Does this mean I do nothing? See, we live in a very different world. We don't have a a government that we don't have a voice in, that we just have to accept. In fact, we have freedoms that are unparalleled in many places around the world. So what do we do? I, I love the model and Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King and what he said. He said, true pacifism, nonviolent resistance, is a courageous confrontation of evil by the power of love. In fact, they, he unpacks six principles of nonviolent resistance, of how to overcome evil with good. Let me just read a few of these and what it looks like to honor those that are, are acting evil in our lives. He says, resist evil without resorting to violence. That's the first one. Second one, nonviolence seeks to win the friendship and understanding of the opponent, not humiliate them. Doesn't it change your perspective? Number three, evil itself, not the people committing uh, the acts, should be opposed. And where you just have this distinction between evil and the people. He says, those committed to nonviolence must be willing to suffer without retaliation. What a perspective of like, I'm going to suffer for the good. And he talks about suffering have its, having its redemptive purpose. Number five, nonviolence not only refuses to shoot his opponent, but he also refuses to hate him. What does beautiful living look like with the unjust authority? Honor God, out of honor for God, I'm going to honor authorities. The reason doing what's right silences the critic. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to honor everyone. I'm going to honor everyone. Whether I agree or disagree with them, I'm going to act honorably. Then he shifts his attention and he moves to... Uh, to his attention to slaves. What I want to talk about is when we think of the biblical text, we actually pull it out of, out of its context in the first century and do great harm. Slaves formed by far the greatest part of the early church. And slaves were the largest, as the largest demographic, he then shifts as if, as if I'm applying it here. I'd go like, okay, how do I apply it 
to those that are in our, our community that are having masters that are unreasonable and unjust. Now, what we have to be careful to do is not import our, the American history of slavery into the first century. So let me give you the uh, context for slavery in the Greco-Roman world. Slavery, first of all, uh, was not race-based. It was not lifelong or founded on kidnapping. Uh, there was a, Rome was a conquest uh, nation as it conquered prisoners of war. In their day, they didn't have, um, you couldn't go bankrupt. And so for those who uh, needed to get out of debt, they often sold themselves or their families into slavery for a time to work their way out of debt. Slavery, when we think about it in the first century, was often indentured servitude for a set period of time. And in fact, slaves, other slaves, and owned other slaves and owned property themselves. Slaves were doctors, professors, administrators, civil servants, actors with the like. Now you think about how many in this empire, there was approximately 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Now, it is not to say all that and say that slaves were treated with dignity or as a person. And in fact, Aristotle would say it this way. There can be no friendship, no justice towards inanimate things. Indeed, not even towards a horse or an ox, nor yet towards a slave as a slave. For a master and a slave have nothing in common. A slave is a living tool. Some are going to be a little slower to start quoting Aristotle now. The Roman attitude was that there was no point in being rulers of the world and doing one's own work. And with Jesus, the social order was flipped upside down. Jesus in Christianity placed the dignity of every human. In fact, the Apostle Paul would say it this way in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no longer a racial divide. There's neither slave nor free. There's no longer a socioeconomic divide. There's neither male nor female. There's no longer a gender gap. He said, but we are one in Christ, that there's this equality and dignity of every single human being. This is revolutionary in the first century. In fact, William Barclay, uh, historian and theologian, writes this. Uh, Callistus, one of the early bishops of Rome, was a slave. And Perpetua, the aristocrat, and Felicitas, the slave girl, met in martyrdom hand in hand. The great majority of the early Christians were humble men and women. Many of them were slaves. It was quite possible in the early days that the slave might be the president of the congregation and the master a member of it. This was a new and revolutionary situation and so when we begin to take that context and think about it into our context, we begin to think about it as this work world and employment world. Notice what Peter says. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, not in fear of your master, in fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only those who are good and considerate, but also those who are harsh, those that are unreasonable. For it is commendable if someone bears up under pain of unjust suffering because they're conscious of God. It's commendable not just to grit through it and I'm, a, I'm just going to make it through it. It's commendable when you say, I am going to endure this because I am aware that I'm doing this for God and I'm enduring this in light of what he's called me to do. Now notice this. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? For some, how is it to your credit if you're doing a bad job at work, you're, you have a low work ethic, and you're getting docked for it, and you're complaining about your boss? That's on you, not your boss. Now, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is such a great line, this is commendable before God. To this you are called. Why? Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his step. The command, out of honor for God, out of honor for God, out of honor for God, I'll honor my boss. Out of honor for God, I'll honor my direct report. He's being unreasonable. She's being unreasonable. They're, they're harsh. They're, they're trying to sabotage me. 
So what does dishonor look like? Well, someone who's trying to sabotage you, you sabotage the project. You begin to speak badly behind their back. Maybe you over-spiritualize things. See, Christians should be the best workers on the planet. Every employer should go, I don't believe what, well, not every point, I don't necessarily believe what they believe, but I want to hire them because, man, they have the best work ethic. They work with an integrity. They bring an attitude that's unparable. That unparalleled. That is the Christian way because we're no longer working for a paycheck or working for a boss. We are working for the Lord. And everything we do, we go, Jesus, I want to do it as if I'm presenting it to you. Like, that's the perspective shift. Out of honor for God. It's not because you're a good boss or a bad boss, a good company or a bad company. Out of honor for God. Where our light would so shine before people in the way that we work in the workplace. Not just the little post that we quote. Or I got my Bible on my desk. That's wonderful, but are you living it out and working hard and doing an excellent job? Well, are you stuck in a bad Job with an unreasonable boss, I want to just tell you this. God sees you and commends you. For some, you needed to hear that this morning. God sees you and commends you. When you do what is right, when you work with a good attitude, and you're enduring a harsh boss for God's sake, he says, I see you. When you feel like you've just been overlooked, when you feel like uh, you, know, you got passed up for that promotion, when you feel like nobody notices the effort that you've put into that, and you just feel like, I'm just on the outside, and gosh, nobody notices, God notices. And it says that he commends you. That word commends means literally to add to your reputation. It builds your reputation. It builds it with God. Does this mean I have to stay in a terrible job? No. Some of you misapply this. I just have to stay in this job and I'm gonna stay here for eternity. In fact, even in this context uh, with slaves, Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 7, 21. He's like, listen, if you're able to get your freedom, get it, do it. Man, for some, you need the freedom. Okay, I need to, I need to get a new job. Application, what do I do to get through? Fix your eyes on Jesus. Did you notice how he finished this? He, he said, oh, I'm still in the Philippians. Got to flip back over. He said this. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Now he's going to unpack the, our example and this example, that word in the Greek is the same idea, and it comes from, uh, remember when you're kids and you're learning how to write, and you had to trace over the letters? That's what that word example means, that we would trace our lives over the life of Christ, that we'd use him as the outline and we'd begin to trace. He who committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when suffered. He made no threats. Instead, so powerful, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. God, this is unjust. This is unfair. This is really hard. And so right now, I'm going to fix my eyes on you, not my job. I'm going to fix my eyes on you, not my boss. I'm going to fix my eyes on you, who suffered way more than I could ever imagine, not my circumstances. I'm gonna lean in. Because I, and that line's so good. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. God, everyone, this may be unjust, but you, you judge justly, and so I'm entrusting my heart and life to you. Example number one, an unjust authority. Example number two, an unreasonable employer. Example number three, he gives us in this beautiful living out, this winsome life, a hard-hearted spouse. He's now gonna shift, and the context is an unbelieving husband. Now, Peter, it's important to note, is not giving a marriage seminar. 
He's not giving the, exclu- the entire unpacking of like, how marriage is to function. Here, he's trying to help those in the church who are most vulnerable uh, in their faith from unjust and a corrupt system. And so what we need to do is unpack marriage in the Greco-Roman world because a wife who gave her life to Jesus was actually in a dangerous position if her husband was an unbeliever. So let's look at, before we dive in and understand the context, marriage in the Greco-Roman world. First, what you'll notice is Aristotle uh, first came up with these, these household codes for slaves, for children, and for wives. And these were codes for how a slave was to behave, how children were be- to behave, and how wives were to behave. So when you see the Apostle Paul and Peter writing on this, they're not making up a new system for Christians that are now I- imposed on them. They're commenting on the system that is already at work and bringing about a new reality for how we're to operate. And so Aristotle talked about these, and there was never an obligation upon the master, the husband, or the father. It was only upon the slaves, the children, and the wives. Um, And in these household codes, under Roman law, a woman had no rights. In fact, uh, William Barclay again writes this. Under Roman law, a woman had no rights. In law, she remained forever a child. When she remained with her father, she was under the patria potestas, the father's power, which gave the father the right even of life and death over her. And when she married, she passed equally into the power of her husband. She was entirely subject to her husband and completely at his mercy. Now, a wife then was to be chaste, to produce children or an heir, and follow the God's of her husband. Um, and this was the picture for them, is their whole purpose as a spouse, as a wife, was just simply to produce a legitimate heir. Whereas a husband on the other side was free to be promiscuous and held the power of life and death over his wife. In fact, uh, it's said that a, a, a husband had three uh, intimate relationships or sexual relationships. Uh, one was with a, his spouse wife that produced a legitimate heir. The second, he could, he could sleep around with any of the slaves that he had in his um, household. And the third was any of the temple prostitutes. None of that was considered infidelity in their culture. And he had held the power of life and death. In fact, Cato the elder, when writing this, uh, an ancient uh, writer, he says this, if you were to catch your wife in the act of infidelity, you can kill her with impunity without a trial, but if she were to catch you, she would not venture to touch you with her finger, and indeed, she has no right. So the minute Peter begins to write into this is to bring hope and direction to wives who are stuck in an unjust, unfair system. How do you navigate that? Peter David's theologian writes in his commentary, in that society, women were expected to follow the religion of their husbands. They might have had their own cult on the side, but the family religion was that of the husband. Peter clearly focuses his address on women whose husbands are not Christians, not that he would give different advice to women whose husbands were Christians, and he adds them as independent moral agents whose decision to turn to Christ he supports and whose goal to win their husband he encourages. This was quite a revolutionary attitude for that culture. And the Apostle Peter then in that context writes this. Wives... In the same way, in what way? In the same way that Jesus responded, the suffering servant, submit yourselves to your own husband. Oh boy. Now, first, what we need to know is the New Testament teaches mutual submission uh, all along the way. What we saw is we're submitting to authorities, unjust authorities, we're submitting to the... Your, your masters were submitted all along the way. Ephesians 5.21 says, uh, submit to one another. We're all to do this in community out of reverence for Christ. It says, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husband. Why? So that any of them do not believe the word. You're stuck in this situation. When they see the pure, uh, that they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence 
of your lives, that you would live this beautiful life that would be so compelling that, that your husbands go, man, I don't get it, I don't understand it, but I, I can't deny how you're living. Then he says this, and Roman culture was opulent. It's all about image, and you just look up Roman hairstyles, and you'll see it's very extravagant, and a woman was valued based on her looks. I'm sure we don't have that problem here today in the 21st century. He says this, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Not that that's bad. It's just don't, it's not where you, don't, where you find your beauty. He says, rather, it should be that of your inner self inside you, the unfaithful beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Some of you are like, oh boy, here we go. Circle that word gentle. Jesus uses that word gentle in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, same word, for they'll inherit the earth. Then he later on, and Matthew uses it of himself, uh, it, are any of you weary, heavy laden? Come to me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. What Peter's saying is just take on the nature of Jesus, which is of great worth in the sight of God. He goes on, for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. Look back to examples that you've seen. Then it says, they submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him Lord, which in that context is sir. It's like, sir. But here's what I want you to get. In the context, Abraham is actually being used as a negative example. If you read the account, Abraham does a lot of dumb things in regards to his marriage relationship with his wife. And Peter's up, upholding Sarah, who acted honorably even when her husband was not honorable. And saying, look to someone who lived and honored well. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. And then it goes on. It says husbands. And you're like, well, wait a second. The husband's part's way shorter. That's not fair. Well, one, if you go to Ephesians, you'll find the husband's part's much longer than the wife's part. Two, this is the first time in history that we have accountability written for husbands. And Christianity introduced it in the writings of Paul and the writings of Peter. Husbands were not held accountable or called to anything, and yet in Christianity said, no, because we're equal and we're dignified. Husbands, you have a standard to live up to. There is a beautiful living for you. Husbands, in the same way, what same way? The way Jesus laid down his life. Be considerate. Like, considerate. Yeah, husband's only consideration was for himself because it was all about him and his family existed for him. And now he's saying, you need to be considerate for your wife, understanding, thoughtful. As you live with your wives, treat them with respect, treat them with honor as the weaker partner. Here we go again. Weaker, by the way. In the Greco-Roman world, might made right. If I was stronger than you, I got to make the rules. And so, as a stronger male-dominated society, men beat their way into submission. And he says, no, 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 you are to honor, to respect your wife. Why? They're heirs of the grace. Co-equals elevated heirs of the grace and the gift of life. Why? By the way, husbands, this is how we treat our spouses will either help or hinder our prayer life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Command, a hard-hearted spouse, command, out of honor for God, honor your spouse. Out of honor for God, honor your spouse. You can jot down underneath this, five, Ephesians 5.21, and the mutual submission. This does not mean you tolerate or endure abuse. This does mean you are not looking outside your marriage. You're not going like, okay, you know what? The grass is greener over there. He's not quite meeting my needs. She's not quite meeting my needs. You know, he's kind of hard-hearted and he's doing his own thing. And so, you know, there's this guy or this gal at, at the office. There's this guy or this gal at, at the gym. And so I'm just going to start having a conversation and begin to have more of what, eh, it's not a physical affair. It's an emotional affair. 
says, out of honor for God, not because they're honorable, but for the Lord's sake, I'm going to honor you. The reason is a winsome life is more attractive than perfect words. See, we think if we could just say the right thing, it would change someone's mind. This is what Peter's getting at. What will change the world, what will change your marriage, what will affect and impact your workplace is how you go about your life. A winsome, integrity-filled life is far more attractive, far more powerful than any of the perfect words you could come up with. And so, would you pray for them, not nag at them? This goes for husbands, wives. Would you pray for them? Would you begin to go, okay, how do I love them in a tangible way and live in a way that would make the gospel compelling. Application, what do you do if you're stuck in a difficult marriage, you're stuck with a hard-hearted spouse? Because it it may not be that they're not a believer, they just might be hard-hearted. Draw from godly mentors who've gone before. Look Look to those who are 10 plus years ahead. Get people in your life who can speak in and to encourage you. If they're at all willing, go to marriage counseling together. Get help. Draw from godly mentors who've gone before. Beautiful living. What do you do when you're stuck in an unjust system you cannot change? He says, in an evil world, begin to live out this beautiful life rooted in your identity in Christ. Refuse to cave to sin. Walk in integrity. Now, as we close, I think the proper way for us to close is prayer. Because for some, you're in that moment right now. And I had a friend who filled out a a, a prayer request card last week, and it was only through the prayer request card that I really knew the depth of what he was going through at his job. And so we're actually going to close by receiving the offering and singing But what I want you to do is if you're in that place, we want to band arms with you and pray with you in that environment. And would you take time and write down on that prayer request card and drop it in the baskets as it goes by, as we respond to the word of God given to us, that we would then begin to invite him to speak and to move and ask, okay, God, what would you have us do with what we just heard? Heavenly Father, we invite you to speak to us. Would you move and work And would you meet each person right where they're at that we might be a community that lives out the reality of your gospel, that we would be a beautiful people. In Jesus' name, amen.